For problem 1, we have 2x plus 3x plus 1 to be evaluated at x equals negative 1. So you could simplify this expression first, or just simply put parentheses around both of the locations for the x's, and then put in negative 1. And when we simplify this, we'll multiply, which gives us negative 2, plus a negative 3, which I'll make minus 3, and then I have plus 1 at the very end. So that's negative 5 plus 1, giving me my answer of negative 4. Same idea for 2. I put negative 2 in place of x, and I could simplify the plus 2, sorry, uh, the plus 1 minus 2 at the end. But first, I square negative 2, and I get 4. And really, this is minus 4 plus 1 minus 2. So let's see, we have negative 4 plus 1 is negative 3. Minus 2 is negative 5. Question 3 has two variables. So I have two different values, 0.5 and 0.1, for x and y, respectively. So we get 5 times, even though these aren't negative, I think I'm still going to use parentheses just to avoid any confusion using a decimal number, but 5 times 0.5 times 0.1 plus, okay, then we get 0.5 minus 0.1. All right, so when I simplify this, I'm just going to go directly to a calculator, hopefully to avoid making a mistake. So when I multiply the first part together, I get 0.25. That makes sense. 0.5 times 0.1 is 0.05. And then we have plus 0.5 minus 0.1. And my final answer when I combine those three together is 0.65. In question four, again, two variables, I have four divided by a half minus one half divided by four. If I divide four by half, that's multiplying by two, which gives me eight. And then if I take a half and divide it by four, I'm really just multiplying the two denominators together, which gives me one eighth. I'm going to write this as, well, Okay, uh, 8 is really 7 and 8 eighths. You can make a note of that, I guess. Right, 8 eighths is 1, add 1 to 7, you get 8. <laughs> and if you take 1 eighth from 8 eighths, that leaves you with a total of 7 eighths. So 7 and 7 eighths is an acceptable answer. You could use an improper fraction or a decimal, but that's the answer. All right, for this one, if I put five in place of all the a's, I get negative, negative five times five plus negative five times five, using parentheses to hopefully avoid some confusion here. Now, if I'm following order of operations strictly, in the strictest sense, I get, okay, that's negative 25 plus, we get another, another negative 25, but I'm squaring that one. Okay, uh, next, if I multiply those two negatives, I get positive 25. And if I square tw a negative 25, it's a positive 625. And the answer for this one is 650. For question six, we have now three variables, b squared minus four ac. Um, this is actually something that shows up within the quadratic formula. And there it is. Remember that thing? Uh, it's just focusing on this portion here. I'm just choosing to write this in uppercase letters. Not, necess not necessary for the problem, but whatever. So again, going back to my expression and putting in those three values carefully into here, we get, okay, that's going to be 4 squared minus 4 times negative 1 times 3. We square the 4, we get 16. All right, I'm noticing one thing. I have a, a negative here, and I'm subtracting something that's going to be a negative number. I can just put a plus sign, leave this all as positive. So it's going to be plus, because I just multiplied those two negatives. But that leaves me with 4, 1, and 3, 
which is 12. And if I add 16 and 12, I get 28. All right, solving the following linear equations for x. All right, I'm going to add 4x to both sides. And this gives me 6x plus 19 is equal to 1. So now I will subtract 19 from both sides, giving me 6x is equal to a negative 18. And if I now divide both sides by 6, I end up with my answer of x is equal to negative 3. For this linear equation, I think I'm first going to distribute and then combine some like terms. So this negative 1 gets multiplied to both terms, and that 2 gets multiplied to those, giving me negative 1 plus 3x, then this plus 6. That's equal to 4 plus 2x plus 2. By combining like terms on the left, I get 3x, negative 1, and a positive 6 is a positive 5, and that is equal to 2x, the 4, and the 2 gives me 6. I'm going to choose to subtract 2x to both sides, which gives me x plus 5 on the left, yet 6 on the right, and after I subtract 5, I get my answer of x is equal to 1. Okay, for question 9, to solve this for x, I'm going to take the approach of canceling the denominators. So that means I need a least common denominator between 6, 3, and 2. 6 cancels all of those perfectly, meaning I'm going to multiply both sides of this equation by 6. And that just simply puts a 6 over 1 next to every single fraction. Great. I can now cancel those. They're gone completely because I just have a 1. 3 goes into itself once, uh, one, uh, twice into 6, and then this 2 goes into this 6 three times. Carefully writing this next piece, this is 1 times x plus 1, meaning I don't need parentheses or need to write that 1 a second time. You can if you'd like, it'll just become x plus 1. That next piece is just a 2 over 1 or just 2, and on the right, I'm going to be careful here. I have 3 that's left over, yet there is an x minus 1 in parentheses. That 3 gets multiplied to both the x and the 1. In fact, that's going to be part of my next step. I'm going to distribute that 3 to both terms. Moving along, we have x. I'll combine the 1 and the 2 to give me 3. If I distribute the 3, I get 3x minus 3. This time, I think I will subtract x from both sides. I will kind of running out of room, so I'm just going to move that over here. That is, again, 3 is equal to 2x minus 3. I will therefore add 3 to both sides, and it gives me 6 is equal to 2x. After I divide both sides by 2, I get my final answer of 3 is equal to x, or if you'd like, x is equal to 3. Again, fractions that I'm going to cancel, meaning I need a least common denominator between, well, I guess technically there's a denominator of 1 here, but just focusing on the 2 and the 5, my least common denominator will be 10, the product of those two numbers. And all that means is I can multiply 10 to each fraction. So that's 10 over 1 times 10 over 1 here. I'm not going to put a 10 over 1 because I don't need to reference the denominator. It didn't really leave a whole lot of room, but that is 10 over 1 times 3x over 2. Going through and canceling all common factors, 5 goes into 10 twice. 2 goes into 10 five times. I don't have to do anything with the 10 times 1. Nothing cancels. And I get 2 goes into 10 five times. So the first one is 2 times 2x, that's 4x. Then we have minus 5 times just x is 5x. On the right, 10 times 1 is 10. And then on the last term, we have 5 times 3, which is 15x. There's no like terms. I'm going to choose to, oh, I'm sorry, there are like terms. 4x minus 5x, that is minus 1x, or just negative x. Now I'm going to, I think I'm going to subtract 15x from both sides. 
getting crazy here. So we have, uh, oh man, we have negative 16x is equal to a positive 10. If I now divide both sides by negative 16, I end up with my answer of x is equal to, it's a negative number, negative 10 over 16. And I suppose that's fine, but why not simplify it? There's a common factor of two that appears in both. Um, we get five in the top and we get eight in the bottom. Negative five eighths is the answer. For question 11, you could just start by distributing this point zero three to both x and seven, but I'm actually gonna do something kind of similar to question 10 where I'm gonna remove the decimals from this problem. And there's a number you can multiply to both sides to do that. To get rid of this decimal, we have to move it two times. Same thing for this one here, you have to move it twice. Here you have to only move it once, but really if I move it twice, it doesn't cause an extra problem. Essentially what I'm saying is I'm multiplying both sides by 100, which means I multiply this by 100, this by 100, and this by 100. This becomes one, which will just be x. This becomes 10, and this becomes three. So I'm multiplying 100 to every single term. I get one x, I'm just putting x. This is 10, and then I have three times x plus seven. As long as the decimal stops, you can always multiply both sides by 10, 100, 1,000, or whatever number you'd like, one followed by some number of zeros to cancel it. Okay, distributing the three to both terms here, we get x plus 10 is equal to 3x plus 21. I'm going to subtract x and then subtract 21. And then I have 2x is equal to negative 11 and I divide two to both sides, and I have my answer of negative 5.5 is equal to x. For question 12, I see there's a fraction here, and if I multiply it by two, it cancels it. I don't think we need to write too much work for this other than to say, I'm gonna multiply both sides of the equation by two, meaning this gets multiplied by two, as well as this and this, and the two times the one half gives me just a one, meaning I don't need to write the one nor the parentheses. So let's double every single term. That's four times x minus four plus six times two x minus eight plus two. I just doubled everything. And as I said already, the two times the one half is just one. I don't need to write it or the parentheses and I get four x plus 22. I'll now distribute the four and the six so I get 4x minus 16 plus 12x minus 48 plus 2 is equal to 4x plus 22. We got some like terms. So I have a 4x and a 12x that is 16x. Okay, I have a, a 16 and a 48 and a plus 2. Don't want to forget that. So that's uh, minus 16 minus 48 plus 2 that is Okay, negative 62. On the other side, I have 4x plus 22. All right, I'm gonna subtract 4x. By the way, if you'd like, in the same step, you could just also add 62 to both sides. If you wanted to sort of move things all at once, there's absolutely nothing wrong with that. But we have 12x on the left and 22 plus 62 is 84 on the right. If I now divide both sides by 12, I get my answer, which is seven. So divide by 12, divide by 12, it takes me to my answer. Like I said, x is seven. Okay, literal equations, two x plus three y is equal to six, we're solving for x. I'm going to start by subtracting three y from both sides. I don't want the y, I want the x by itself. So I got two x is equal to six minus three y. We're practically done after we divide both sides by two. And I have my answer. X is equal to six minus three y over two. 
now we're solving for y, meaning, okay, we've got, we've got to get rid of the uh, 2x, so very similar to the previous one. 3y is equal to, I'll write that as 6 minus 2x, but now I need to divide both sides by 3. And in doing so, I have solved for y. It is 6 minus 2x all over 3. We are now solving for x. I'll move everything, I guess, to the left for x's and everything else to the right. That means I'm going to subtract 2x from both sides. And I get 3x minus 8y plus 1 is equal to negative 12y plus 4. You could always do like several steps together. There's nothing wrong with that. But I'm going to add 8y. And I get 3x plus 1 is equal to negative 4y plus 4. I only have to subtract 1 as my last step, and I have, not my last step, almost my last step. 3x is equal to negative 4y plus 3. If I now divide both sides by 3, I do have x by itself. My answer is x is equal to negative 4y plus 3 over 3. I'm now solving for x. I'm noticing that it has a 1 half next to it. So why not just double every single term so this becomes a 1? That will be my first step. Doubling everything, I get 10y plus 1x, so I'll just put x, plus 8 is equal to 2y. So now I can subtract 10y from both sides. Hey, why not at the same time subtract 8? There's nothing wrong with doing that. And I have x by itself. I get 2 minus 10y, so that's negative 8y. The 8 does not connect with anything, so there's my answer, negative 8y minus 8. In 17, we're solving for h, so I want to cancel the 1 half. Multiplying both sides by 2 gives me 2a. 1 half times 2 is just 1. I won't write it. And I have h times b plus b. To solve for h, I can simply divide both sides by b plus uppercase b. And in doing so, on the left, I get 2a over, I don't even need the parentheses around the b plus uppercase b. You can simply write this. And that is equal to h. What happened is those two factors completely canceled, and I have my answer. All right, for 18, we're now solving for lowercase b instead of h. And I'm going to start the same way by multiplying both sides by 2. So I get 2a is equal to h times b plus uppercase b. Now, I want to get this by itself, which means I'll have to deal with this uppercase b, but I can get rid of this h first by dividing it to both sides. So divide this by h and this by h. We are canceling this common factor. And on the left, we get 2a over h is equal to b plus uppercase b. I can simply subtract that uppercase b to both sides. It does not combine with anything on the left. It's kind of a mess, but you have 2a over h minus uppercase b is equal to lowercase b, the thing we were solving for. To solve this conversion formula from Fahrenheit to Celsius for the capital C, so we're solving for C, I can first subtract 32 from both sides of this equation. And on the left, we get f minus 32 is equal to 9 fifths times c. And in one step, we can get rid of this 9 and this 5 by multiplying both sides by its reciprocal, 5 ninths. But I did that on the right. I want to be careful and use some parentheses and say I'm multiplying the entire left side by 5 ninths. On the left, the 5s and the 9s cancel. It's just a 1, which I won't even write. But c is equal to 5 ninths times quantity f minus 32. You could distribute this into the expression if you'd like, but this is a fine way to write your answer. For 20, we are solving for h, so that's v is equal to pi r squared h. By the way, this is the formula for the volume of a right cylinder. 
boom, where the r here represents the radius of a circle, right? Pi r squared is the area of this top circle, and then you multiply it by the height of the cylinder, giving you the volume that this thing takes up. That does not matter for this question. All we need to do is solve for h. And I got this pi and r squared, which stuff I can just divide to both sides of my equation. This one's pretty easy in that I divide both sides by pi as well as r squared, and it completely cancels on the right. And my answer is v divided by pi r squared, and that is equal to h. The absolute value of x plus 3 is equal to 4 can be broken into two equations, as all these absolute value equations can be. So equal to not only positive 4, but negative 4. When I solve this, I'll just subtract 3 from both sides. I can do that directly in both equations. And I get x is equal to negative 7, yet x equals 1. And both of those are solutions. If you'd like, you can plug them in place of x to check. Um, but that is it for 21. The two equations would be 2x minus 5 is equal to negative 17, and 2x minus 5 is equal to positive 17. Those are the two equations that will give you the two solutions to the absolute value of 2x minus 5 is equal to 17. I will add 5 to both sides of both equations, and I get 2x is equal to negative 12, as well as 2x is equal to 22. I now divide both sides by 2, and I can do that again in both equations. And I get x is equal to negative 6, as well as x is equal to 11. The absolute value of 1 minus 4x equals 8 becomes 1 minus 4x is equal to negative 8, and 1 minus 4x is equal to positive 8. I will subtract 1 from all of my equations. I get negative 4x is equal to negative 9, as well as negative 4x is equal to 7. And dividing both sides by negative 4, again, in both equations, is resulting in 9 fourths in the one on the left, and then negative 7 fourths in the one on the right. All right, the absolute value of negative 0.5x plus 1, we get negative 0.5x plus 1 is, of course, equal to negative 100, but also it can be equal to positive 100. I will subtract 1, which gives me negative 0.5x is equal to negative 101, versus over here where you have negative 0.5x is equal to 99. If I divide both sides by negative 0.5 at the same time, that's the same thing as doubling my answer. We're dividing by a half, which means multiply by two. So on this equation here, again, dividing by that negative 0.5, we get x is equal to positive, and if we double 101, we get 202 over here. If we double 99, it's going to be negative 198. Question 25 had something a little bit different. In all of our equations, it was just an absolute value is equal to a number, which allowed us to split it up into two equations. If there's a number that's next to the absolute value, positive or negative, you have to get rid of it before moving forward with this process. So I'm going to subtract 8 from both sides of this equation. And we've changed it to the absolute value of 5x minus 11 is equal to 23. Now I can apply this process of, oh, okay, this is really 5x minus 11 is equal to negative 23. Got to solve that. As well, as 5x minus 11 is equal to positive 23. I will add 11 to both sides. In doing so, I get 5x is equal to negative 12 and 5x is equal to 34. And if I divide both sides by 5, in both equations, there's no common factors that can cancel. I think it's fine to leave it as negative 12 fifths as one answer, and then 34 fifths as my other. 
To solve an absolute value equal to an absolute value, it's slightly different, although we are breaking it down into two equations. The only reason it looks different is because you're gonna have variables on both sides of your equation. So one of those equations is gonna be just let one equal the positive of the other, just like completely ignore the absolute values. That is 2x plus one is equal to x plus five. So just leave them all the same. Or as another possibility, this could equal the negative of this, which is really analogous to this up here. It's saying, let this positive thing equal this negative thing. That is, I'll leave 2x plus one completely alone but make the other side of my equation negative, being careful to put parentheses around it to mean that the negative gets distributed to both terms. So now these equations aren't gonna be identical anymore, but as we solve them, we'll distribute this negative. We get two x plus one is equal to negative x minus five. Again, this two x plus one equals x plus five did not change. Um, I think I'll just continue solving this equation over here. I'll add x to both sides. And at the same time, why not subtract one from both sides? This gives me three x is equal to negative six. And when I divide both sides by three, I get x is equal to negative two. Over on the other equation, I would subtract x from both sides. I would still subtract one from both sides. The answer I get here is now x is equal to four, and those are my two solutions. If I set up my two equations for 27, again, it would be like two minus three x, leave it completely alone, is equal to four x plus seven. And then I have to make one of these negative, leave one positive. Since it doesn't matter which side it goes on, and this has a negative in it, why don't I multiply the negative here? So it doesn't matter which one you make negative, it's just one of them has to be negative. I'll choose to write it as negative two times, sorry, negative two minus three x is equal to 4x plus 7. Solving this equation first, I get negative 2 plus 3x is equal to 4x plus 7. I will at the same time subtract 3x from both sides as well as subtract 7, and my answer is negative 9 is equal to x. Focusing on my other equation, I guess I will add 3x and subtract seven, giving me negative five is equal to seven x. And if I divide both sides by seven, I have my answer of negative five sevenths is equal to x. So for this one, um, I'm going to let one minus x equal to, and I'll make the other side negative. At this point, that negative gets distributed to both terms why don't we skip a step and just put a negative here and make this one positive. Therefore, we get negative nine plus two x. So that's the one equation equaling the negative of the other. My second equation would be just leave both of them completely alone. I wanna solve both of these. I'm going to add x to both sides as well as add nine. I get 10 is equal to 3x. And if I divide both sides by 3, that is my answer as an improper fraction, 10 thirds. In my other equation, I'm going to, I think, add 2x to both sides, yet subtract 1 from both sides. subtract one. That gives me x is equal to eight, and that's the answer. I feel like something weird is gonna happen in question 29 here, but well, let's go for it. I'm gonna make this the negative one, meaning I'll distribute a negative to both terms. In doing so, two x minus three is left alone, yet distributing the negative gives me negative three plus two x. My other equation is just leave both of them alone. Great. In this equation here, there's a two X on both sides. If I subtract two X from both sides, 
I mean, if you want to, you could also add three. And in doing so, we get zero is equal to zero. Hmm. This is always true. Let's check out our other equation. All right, in this one, I'm going to, I guess, add two to both sides, two x, and also add three. And I get four x is equal to six. If I divide both sides by four, I get that x is equal to six fourths or if I cancel a factor of two, that is three halves. So what does this mean? And this is different. On this equation over here, everything works. On this equation over here, only one number works. This means that the solution is all real numbers. Any number that you put in place of x works in this equation, meaning it'll always work in this equation. Uh, 3 halves is also a solution, but it's already included in all real numbers, so the answer to this one is everything works. For question 30, again, I think something weird is going to happen in this one too, but I'll take the same approach where, okay, I'm going to make this the negative of this, meaning I get a negative here and a positive here. Let's check that out. That's negative one plus five x is equal to eight plus five x. And then I'll just set the two equal to each other. One minus five x is equal to eight plus five x. In solving the equation on the left, I'll, I guess, subtract five x from both sides. I mean, if you wanted to, you could, I think I should just leave it like this. You know, we could start adding one or subtracting eight. But it won't matter because I get negative 1 on the left and 8 on the right, and this is always false. Or I'll just even say this is false. If you compare that to what happened up here, this was always true, and it meant that everything worked. Anything you put in place of x will make this true. Now down here, this is always false, and that means that nothing over here will work. No number will go in place of x to make this thing a true statement. Now, we can still check to see what's going on over here because potentially you could get a solution. Let's see. I'm going to add 5x to both sides and also subtract 8. And I get negative 7 is equal to 10x. After dividing both sides by 10, I have my answer of negative 7 tenths. So this is, in fact, the only solution to this equation. If we think about all this work, this gave us nothing. This gave us one thing. This is the only number that works in the equation. Comparing that to, again, question number 29, this gave us one thing, but this gave us everything. And you combine one thing and everything together, and you get everything works. For questions 31 through 34, I'm going to be using the above formula that converts a Celsius number to a Fahrenheit. So again, we're just simply plugging numbers into a formula and simplifying them. So F is equal to 9 fifths of 30 plus 32. I'm going to write that as 30 over 1 so I can start canceling common factors. 5 goes into 36 times. F is equal to 9 times 6 plus 32. That is 54 plus 32. This means my answer is F is equal to 86 degrees Fahrenheit. For 32, um, we got negative 5, so C is negative 5. Plugging that into my formula, I get 9 fifths times negative 5 plus 32. Simplifying, putting in a fraction. 5 goes into itself once, so this whole first portion is just negative 1 times 9, which is negative 9. And if I add 
32 to that, I get 23. 23 degrees Fahrenheit is negative 5 degrees Celsius. For 230 degrees Celsius, that is F is equal to 9 fifths. I'll just write this as 230 over 1. I know eventually we're going to have to start canceling some common factors. It's completely okay if you do this in your calculator. There's nothing wrong with that. 5 goes into itself once. It goes into 230. Who knows how many times? Oh, my goodness. Uh, oh, 46 times. Okay, so that is 9 times 46 plus 32 in my calculator. This is 446 degrees Fahrenheit is the same as 230 degrees Celsius. For the last question using this conversion, we have, well, what if you had negative 40 degrees Celsius? Doesn't matter if you put the degrees Celsius there, we're just putting a number in place of C. F is equal to, it's 9 fifths, that's being multiplied to negative 40 over 1 plus 32. Okay, so 5 goes into itself once, it goes into 48 times, that's a negative 8. 9 times negative 8 is negative 72. And if we add 32 to that, we get, I think that's the same, it's negative 40. So this is kind of interesting, that negative 40 degrees Celsius is equal to negative 40 degrees Fahrenheit. These, this is actually the only time where this happens where these two temperatures meet and it's at negative 40. Questions 35 and 36 refer to the formula A is equal to 1 half the base times the height. That is the formula for the area of a triangle. So for 35, I want to find the area of a triangle whose base is 25 feet and height is 10 feet. Plugging this into the formula, including the units, gives me the area is equal to 1 half of 25 feet times 10 feet. So that is 250 if we multiply 25 and 10, and then if we divide that by 2, that is 125. So that was this times this, 250, divided by 2, 125. But we also have feet being multiplied by feet. If we treat this as any other variable, feet times feet is feet squared, which makes sense. Distance is something like feet, but area is going to be square feet. So here's my answer. 125 square feet is the amount of space that this triangle takes up. For 36, we're going backwards a little bit here where I give you the area is equal to 100 square feet. And I know the base is equal to 20 feet. But we're solving for the height. So what I'm going to do is take this formula. I'm actually going to solve it for h. So that might be a good thing to look at first. Take my formula. I want to multiply both sides by 2. Since I'm solving for h, I'm going to divide both sides by b. 2a over b is equal to h. I'll put that again over here h is equal to 2a over b. It's nice to solve for your formula this way because now you can just take the given information, put it here, put this here, and simplify it. Let's do that. h is equal to 2 times 100 square feet divided by 20 feet. If we focus on just the numbers, so 2 times 100 is 200, and if we divide by 20, that's going to give us 10. But the units should be feet, and it makes sense in our formula, right? I mean, in the numerator, we have square feet. In the denominator, we have feet to the first power. 
Like if this was x squared over x, it would just be x to the first. Same thing holds for feet. It's gonna be, if I do this two minus this one, we get our answer of 10 feet and the units actually make sense too. That's the final answer.